Klaus, a PhD student from UFMG, and I will be the chair of this session. <laughs> and now we have the second lecture of Ernesto Galvão. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Klaus. So I'd like to start by thanking everybody who is here this early in the morning. I know that one of the student houses organized a party last night. Um, and I want to thank you especially if you were in that party, okay? Um, so taking up from where we stopped uh, last time, more or less, um, I was motivating why, why it's interesting to have a look at restricted models of quantum computation, right? First, because we can find some regimes in which quantum computers are simulable. So that means you can understand classicality better from a computational point of view, right? Second, because you can find some intermediate models which may be useful, right? And I'll give a couple of examples right at the beginning of today's talk. And also because you can, in implementing one of these intermediate models, you can minimize resource usage. So you may, you may bring these protocols uh, within reach of experiment, experiments today. So that's another motivation for looking at simplified quantum computers. So I gave you a, this picture, which I'll just skip, right? And I'd like to recall uh, a concept that uh, Richard Joza explained in detail yesterday, a uh, main difference between two different ways of simulating a classical uh, quantum computer and a classical computer. The first one is actually by calculating all probabilities, but that's demanding too much of the classical computer because the quantum computer doesn't tell us what the probabilities are. It just samples from that probability distribution. So the more, more fair way of, of, of doing a simulation on a classical computer is doing weak simulation in which you just ask that the classical computer outputs the same distribution of zeros and ones that the quantum computer will, okay? So, uh, so you're not asking the classical computer to do more than the quantum computer is doing, but just the same thing, okay? And one example of this is a, a Clifford circuit which on computational basis, input and measurement is simulable strongly. And if you add a magic states that we discussed last time, then it becomes universal for quantum computation. So it's not simulable at all, right? Because we believe quantum computers in general are not simulable by uh, classical computers. So now I'd like to move to uh, one particular way of proving that many of these restricted models are, are, are non-simulable, they're hard to simulate, okay? And this way, this proof relies on uh, some computational complex assumptions. I won't go much into the computational complexity part of it, but I'll tell you what the recipe is, okay? And we just import some results from complexity theory. And then we'll apply this, this recipe to a, a, a restricted model of quantum computation called IQP. So, First, we need the concept of post-selection, okay? So what is post-selection? <coughs> Suppose you take a, a, a circuit, you, and you want to do a computation in a funny way, which is you, you're going to measure a specific qubit, say the first one, okay? And what you're demanding is not to do a unitary that solves your problem, but to do a unitary that conditionally on this first qubit coming out one solves the problem. Okay, so this seems, might seem not, if you haven't thought about it before, might seem not, not like a, a big change, but it is, because you can design a unitary which gives an exponentially small probability of outputting one, but which solves the problem conditionally on it having outputted one, you see? So uh, 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 allowing for you to do things conditionally on the output of one qubit, of measurement of one qubit, uh, actually gives you lots of power. If you were able to say, I want this, uh, this qubit to one, and I want all the others to have the result that would appear if this one was one. So it's a power that we don't have. It's a non-physical thing, doing post-selection this way, okay? Uh, of course, experimenters do post-selection all the time, because many times you, you, don't, you don't have an option, but uh, they can't do it uh, on a very large system, otherwise the thing, you have to wait the age of the universe for, for, for the result to come out, okay? So, the class of problems that you can solve in this funny way is called post-BQP from post-selected uh, bounded quantum poly polytime, right? So remember, BQP is the class of problems that are reasonably solved by a quantum computer in a, with a uh, high probability. So, as I said, post-selection is unphysical, okay? And one way of seeing this from a computational complexity point of view, in that, in that little tree of, uh, in that little graph of complexity classes, 
Uh, Scott Aronson proved that BP, BQP is promoted to PP if you allow for post selection. And if you look, PP is above NP here in this tree, which means quantum computers with post selection can solve NP complete problems. Okay? So uh, that's another evidence that post selection should not be allowed by nature, and, uh, and uh, that it's very powerful. Okay? So. No, I mean, okay, so this is a different class. This is a different class. If you bound this probability of success, then you go back to BQP, okay? But if you don't bound, this class PP is the class of problems that you can solve with, uh, with any deviation from probability half, even if it's a small, exponentially small deviation from a half, okay? And, uh, and allowing for post-selection allows you to do that. Um, so another way to see that uh, this, this class is unphysical is computationally, okay? This is just a little circuit that factors numbers efficiently using post-selection. So I, again, I say post-selection is cheating, okay? Uh, because basically what, the, what the, the circuit does is to start with all possible factors to do the, calculate the remainder, that is do the division of the number by all these factors. And with this post-selected, uh, this circuit here, is changing this one into a zero, okay, if the division didn't work, didn't come out zero, the remainder, okay? So post-selecting on this thing being one means the division worked, there was no remainder. So basically what you're doing is you're trying all the solutions in, in parallel and you're post-selecting on having found the solution, okay? That's clearly cheating, okay? But, uh, but it's exactly what the kind of computer with post-selection can do, a quantum computer with post-selection can do, okay? So you might think, okay, why do, we, wh why do we look at this complexity class? And one reason is, well, we want to understand better what BQP is. We have to modify it to see how powerful it could be or what restrictions, what restrictions how restrictions uh, decrease its computational power, right? And another reason is that this, 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 uh, this idea is helpful uh, for proofs, okay? It helps you prove things about real, I mean, physically uh, uh, interesting complexity classes. <coughs> so, uh, the argument that can be done, there is an argument that can be done showing that if you have a restricted, so this is a picture of these words, okay? If you have a restricted quantum computer, okay, and you do post-selection on it, and you solve a problem with post-selection, and actually you show that in this way you can solve any problem that quantum mechanics can do with post-selection. So this means the restricted is less than the quantum computer, but if it, with post-selection, does as much as quantum computer with post-selection, so you're giving an extra resource to both of them, okay? And if both of them come out with the same computational power, which is post-BQP, then you can prove that the restricted quantum computer on its own without post-selection is hard to simulate, okay? It's not obvious that this is true, okay? I'm just importing this theorem from complexity theory. Um, and it's been used many times. So the trick is, if you have a restricted quantum computer and doing post-selection on it, you prove that you can do anything that a quantum computer can do with post-selection, this means that this restricted computer is hard to simulate, okay? And this is the recipe that allows you to prove many different results for restricted quantum computers. So these four systems, um, which some of which we'll see, IQP and boson sampling, and we'll see the QC1 too, I hope, uh, they, they all can be proven to be hard to simulate exactly, weakly, using that argument, okay? So we'll start by looking at IQP. Okay, so what is this computational class IQP? IQP was studied by Shepard, Bremen, and Joza, okay? And it consists of a circuit which is diagonal in the X basis. So the input basis and output basis are the computational basis that we used to, but all the gates here are diagonal in the X basis. And being diagonal in any basis means you can do all of them in any order you want. They commute, 
the diagonal. Okay? So the class IQP consists of computations in which the temporal order of the gates don't, doesn't matter. Okay? There's no time ordering because you can do the gates in any order you like. So this is like getting a, a, one of these algorithms to do this and then do that and then do that and scrambling everything. Okay? You're saying you don't have the choice of choosing which order you're, you're doing things. I mean, you have this choice. I mean, any order will do. It's all the same. Okay? So, of course, this is equivalent to a circuit which is diagonal in the Z basis and uh, in which each qubit undergoes a Hadamard at the beginning and at the end. So it's the same because the Hadamard transforms the Z basis to the X basis, right? So these are IQP circuits. So if you think, I don't allow any control of the order in which things, I'm, I'm going to do things, this is a very severe restriction, okay? We have this intuition that uh, a computation proceeds by steps, and you can't do this step ahead if you haven't done this step be before, right? Order is important in computation. So, so, uh, so this is a, a strong restriction. But you can show that these restricted circuits, you see all these, these unitaries are quite different from the, from the general unitary. They are hard to simulate using the, the argument I showed you. So how do you go about doing that? You start with a, a general circuit, a general circuit, okay? It's not an IQP circuit, a general circuit. Now you add identities. Hadamard squared is identity, we've seen it many times. So you can, add, you can add these identities, if you like, in any qubit here, so that you put this circuit in this other form, in which all the qubits undergo a Hadamard at the beginning and the end. I haven't changed the circuit. I just added identities, OK? I added identities for it to look a bit like IQP, right? But this circuit's not like IQP, because this, this universal set I have, it does have diagonal in Z gates, which is T, C, Z, and Z. But it has Hadamards, too, in the middle. And the Hadamards in the middle are making the difference between being IQP and not being IQP, being universal. OK? So the problem we have is this circuit is not IQP because there are some Hadamards in the, in the box there. These are fine, but the Hadamards in the middle here make the IQP computer become universal. So what do you do? Every time you have a Hadamard in the middle here, it may be preceded by U and followed by V, you use this teleportation gate, which is related, it's the one bit teleportation gate we've seen before in Philips talks, for example. So what this, what this gadget does is you, you take this qubit that's coming here, you do a CZ with this other qubit, which is an uh, auxiliary qubit that you initialize in zero, do a Hadamard, undergoes a CZ, and then you go about your business, okay? If you do this measurement here and it comes out zero, this state here is going to be teleported to this state here. It's the one-bit teleportation protocol for the Hadamard gate, okay? So it is a teleportation way of doing the Hadamard. And the interesting thing about it is that at the end of this line here, you have a Hadamard. At the beginning of this line, you have a Hadamard. So this means this is in IQP format. You can bring this, this guy here to the beginning of the computation, and you can bring this guy here to the end of the computation. You've just added one auxiliary qubit for each Hadamard you want to do the IQP way in the middle here. Do you have questions about it? OK. So what, what did we do? We took a general computer and turned it into an IQP computer but which will only work as a general computer if you can post-select on measuring zero here, right? That's exactly what you wanted, Fine, right? Because on post-selection, this computer will work like a quantum computer. If you post-select even more, then you get post-BQP instead of BQP, right? Because it's a quantum computer, you can post-select on it if you like. So you manage to reach post-BQP power from a restricted IQP circuit, post-BQP power, from a restricted IQP circuit using post-selection. So this means the original uh, IQP circuits of this format without the H are simulable, are not simulable, sorry, are hard to simulate exactly, weakly, on a classical computer. Okay? Do you have questions about this model? I'm moving on. I mean, there have been other results showing that, because this, this proof 
it shows that uh, the, the IQP circuit is hard to simulate exactly weakly. But people are interested in, in approximate simulations because if you implement such a circuit, you only uh, get approximations of it because of experimental errors, right? There are some arguments that it, it is also hard to simulate ex uh, exp approximately, okay? But they're not as strong as this. It relies on other hypotheses, okay? Other than the hypothesis that we had to use, which is a competition complex hypothesis saying that the polynomial hierar hierarchy will collapse. This is a, a tower of different uh, complexity classes which are believed to be different. And if this thing doesn't go through, they would all collapse, many of them would collapse into the same class. So it's, it's similar to saying, oh, I want to, this proof relies on P being different from NP. It's not as strong as that, but it's believed to be quite strong. Okay, so that, that's what has to happen if we are to believe. This is a hypothesis we have to believe that this tower of complex class doesn't collapse for this to go through. Okay, this kind of proof. So the second model, the, res the second restricted model that I like to talk about is the DQC1, okay? It's called one clean qubit, and we'll see why. So Neil and Laflamme uh, were interested in nuclear magnetic resonance experiments. And if you, if you, if you know about this kind of uh, system, you know that this, the, the state that they have is highly, highly mixed, the state of the nuclei, you know, in your magnetic resonance uh, uh, ex uh, experiments. So they propose this model, which is a bit simplified, but which captures uh, the idea of what can we do if our, our qubits are mostly very mixed, okay? So this consists of a general unitary, one qubit which you can initialize in a pure state, but all the others you have no control about, and you assume that they are in the maximum mixed state, okay? So, and at the end, you're allowed to measure one qubit, to get the results of some problem. So that's the idea, okay? So these guys you can't change. You can, you can just change this one, right? So what can you do with that? First thing to notice is that where do we input the problem, right? The input to the problem, where does it go? Because you only have one qubit here. So as usual, I mean, it's not the usual thing that you can put the input here because you don't have space for it, right? So the input is actually encoded in the negative decomposition of U. So uh, the problem actually will be finding some property of you that you, you, and, and you provided you by giving a gate decomposition of you in some universal set of gates, okay? So depending on the problem, you have a different you here and you try to solve uh, to find some property of you, okay? And the class of problems which can be solved like this is called the QC1. Uh, the class of problems that can be solved with a polynomial size u uh, with high probability. One question for you. Why can't, why, can't allow, why can't I allow intermediate measurements here in adaptive computation? What if I change the, 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 the problem just a little bit, the model, to allow for intermediate measurements? What's the problem with this, this idea? When I ask the problem, right, usually it's a restricted computer, so the problem would be, ah, oh, it won't be restricted anymore, okay? But how would that, that happen? Any idea? No, but it's fine, because you can have pieces of unitaries followed by measurements, and then adaptive new unitaries. So it's fine, it's many ad, uh, unitaries with measurements. It's, that's not a problem. Exactly. We know that measurements prepare pure states. The, pro the, 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 the system is all about what can we do if we don't have pure states. And if you do measurements, you prepare pure states. So if you prepare pure states and, and you can adapt, so you prepare a zero or a one, and you do, you, you do universal quantum computation because you just prepare input qubits and do unitaries on them, right? So you can't allow intermediate measurements. But what can you do then, okay, with this kind of circuit? So the, the way to use these circuits for something useful is to use the, the, the Hadamard test, which is a nice little circuit, which is useful in many situations. So how does it work? Suppose here you have n qubits, okay? I put one wire, but there are many lines here. You start with a plus state at the top qubit, and here, it's a different, it's, it's a different thing from here, okay? And here you start with many qubits. 
If you do this control U followed by Hadamard at the top and measurement in the computational basis, you can go through the co ca calculation and find that the probability of this guy coming out zero depends on the U at the bottom here. Okay? There's a kickback from the other register into the top register. Uh, it depends exactly on uh, the real part of this uh, expectation value of U for Psi. Okay? So, if you do uh, many measurements, a polynomial number of measurements, you can estimate this quantity here. And if you start with a different state, 0 minus i1, then you can estimate the imaginary part of you, of this element of you. Okay? So, this is just a simple circuit identity, which is helpful in many situations. So, how do we use it there? You do exactly as I said, control u. Okay? So, if you're given u, you know the gate decomposition. You can adapt, you can transform each gate into a controlled version of it, and you can implement control U. So, so you can do that from the input of the, the, the computation. And you, you, you choose these states, okay, to be one of the computational basis states with equal probability. It can be any computational state, and you choose them randomly, okay? This is equivalent to producing maximum mixed states, okay? But I'll just think of uh, one of them. If you do, a particular X register here, this top guy here, I mean, if you're doing many different Xs, the top qubit will be proportional to the real part of this, the average of the real part of this, right? And you can rewrite this as the trace of U, right? Because you're taking exactly the trace, that's the definition of the trace of a, an operator, right? So what, what the circuit is doing is calculate, uh, estimating the trace of U if you do random, uh, random inputs here. It estimates the trace of U, okay? So doing random uh, uh, input states here is equivalent to picking a maximum mixed state for each qubit, right? So this means the DQC1 model running on a circuit like this estimates the trace of U. But you remember that U is given me to me as a gate decomposition, but actually the, its size, if you have n qubits, is 2 to the n by 2 to the n. It's a huge U. So a classical computer cannot expand this thing, write down the U, much less compute the trace, okay? So this is something that's hard to do, apparently. We don't have a proof again, but it's considered, it's, it's, it's assumed to be hard, okay? And you can do, you can do a, a collapse of the polynomial hierarchy, like the, the previous argument I did, similar to, to what I did for IQP, to prove that uh, this thing can't be simulated uh, exactly, okay? It's a, it's slightly different because you, you can only measure one qubit. You can't do post-selection in the usual way, but it's a, a similar argument. And it's useful. It's been shown that estimating traces of operators help in estimating um, um, some invariants in knot theory to decide whether two knots are the same or not. For example, you can calculate some invariants of one knot and another knot to compare and see if they are the same. So this problem solves this problem, and there's no, no known classical way of, of solving, calculate, a, estimating Jones polynomials, these, uh, mo, uh, these, uh, these invariants for, in knot theory. And it's helpful to estimate other properties of U, which people are interested in if you study quantum chaos, like integrability, fidelity decay, and so on. So it's not surprising, right? You can, you're, you're exploring properties of U via the circuit. Sorry? True. I mean, there, there, I know, I know what you mean. If you have a U which is a black box, you can't control, you can't turn it into a controlled version of it. But the U here is given by the input of the problem as a gate decomposition. So the DQC1, the input to the problem is, have a look at this circuit here, okay? You have 100 qubits, this is the composition with 1,000 gates here. This is the circuit. So if you have the circuit, each gate, you can do a controlled version of it. There are, there are standard constructions for that, okay? But if, if it were a black box given to you, then I agree with you, it's impossible to do the controlled version of it. Do you get it? Yes. I, true, I mean, <coughs> I don't know what the complexity status is of the estimating. It's not a decision problem. Estimating the traces of a unitary. So how hard it is. It's not a decision problem. I don't know what the complexity is. 
But I do know that it's, uh, it would collapse the polynomial hierarchy by uh, the arguments that you, you know about, right? So that's all I know about the complexity. Yes, yes. So because DQC1 is the class of problems solved, solved, solvable by a U which has a polynomial description. No, 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 no. It's polynomial, sorry. It is polynomial. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I shouldn't have written this, okay? Uh, the matrix is exponential because the, the, the U is given by a polynomial description. Forget about this line, okay? I should have said U is poly N. Hence, the matrix describing you is exponential in it. Okay, that's all. Sorry, that, that, that's bad. B ba my bad, yeah. <laughs> okay? So, you can ask, uh, why is this model useful? The thing is so mixed, okay? And start analyzing like uh, Richard Joseph did in the last talk. Uh, is, it, is there entanglement there to help, right? If you compute the entanglement between any, any of those guys here, which are in mixed states, sorry. Here they're pure, but they should be mixed, right? Uh, there's no entanglement, of course. Uh, you can com compute the entanglement of part of those with the others, including the pure qubit. The pure qubit is the only guy that can give you some entanglement, right? And if you do that, the partition, there is a little bit of entanglement, but it doesn't increase with the size of the unitary, the size of the register, because you're increasing the number of mixed qubits. You're not increasing the entanglement at all. At all. So if you believe, and there are many results in that line, that you need en entanglement that increases with the system size, then uh, this doesn't fit the requirement. And it, nevertheless, it seems to be hard to simulate on a classical computer. Some people have asked whether quantum discord, if you know about this measure of quantumness, uh, plays a role in this model. I doubt it, okay? But uh, people have, have been interested in this kind of problem. So, this is a little bit of uh, just, okay? It's always moving, okay? So, this is a little bit of a, rehash of what Richard Joseph told us last time. We know that entanglement, what's necessary for a speed up? Entanglement's not sufficient. You can see that in Clifford circuits, which are highly, highly entangled, typical entanglement you have. But some is necessary. So th there, there's, some, there's a result by, by Richard himself and Lyndon uh, showing that. And there's a simple argument that he went through last time. But not much entanglement is necessary. We saw that in DQC1, we've just seen, there's very little entanglement there. And we saw in Van der Nest's scheme for general uh, uh, BQP circuits with little entanglement that Richard Jones explained to us yesterday. So it was great that he gave this talk before mine. Okay. Um, and we know also that it depends on which measure you're talking about, right? Continuous measures of entanglement, they all fall in the same category. You can make them very, very small, polynomially small, and still do the computation using Van der Nest's scheme. So this works for the, uh, for, for the entropy. But it works for any other measure of entanglement which is continuous. But you have these discontinuous measurements like Schmidt rank. And uh, these are still high in these models. If they were not high right, enough, then we would be able to simulate them using MPS simulation schemes. So, and that, then hence they wouldn't be powerful. right? They would be as powerful as our classical computers. And we've seen, I mean, with these models, there, there's some combination of resources, dynamics, input states, and measurements that give you power, computational power. It's not anything alone that gives you power. It's a combination of different uh, resources, right? And you can have some, uh, some trade-offs. For example, if you have a restricted Clifford computer, you can still do universal quantum computation if you allow for magic states, right? So you're trading off the, the capability of doing a gate by the capability of uh, preparing a state and using it in the computation. Now we move to uh, measurement-based quantum computation, okay? So, measurement-based quantum computation, we, we, we have seen already lots of this, okay, in Philip's talk yesterday. I'll go through some of these things again, so be patient. Uh, it's always good to see more than once something that's unfamiliar to you. So. It proceeds by having many qubits, entangling them between first neighbors in some graph, okay? That gives you the neighborhood uh, uh, structure. And then measuring them one by one in some sequence with adaptive measurements, right? That's in general in words how the model works. But w w the idea is to try to understand how this can be. 
And the basic idea that makes this work, the first idea that uh, pointed towards this possibility, was the gate teleportation idea by Gordon Schwang in 1999. Okay? Since then, there have been more than one model of measurement based on the computation that does different types of measurements or using different types of entangled states. What we call all of them, I'll call them all of them measurement based on computation and BQC. Okay? The most well known model is the one way model that was proposed by Rausendorf and Briegel a couple of years after the Gottesman Schwang uh, uh, seminar idea. I'll go through a little, a little it's not a proof, okay? but it's a didactic way of, of trying to see how on earth something like that can work for quantum computation. Okay? And it, it's, it comes from this paper by McCaig. You can find on my, on my website of the course uh, links to other tutorials that you can go and read on your own to, to, to learn more about it. So, we start with the one bit Z teleportation circuit. Okay? So, this is just an identity. It means start with a state psi, start with an auxiliary state, do a control knot, and measuring the X basis. Okay? If you do that, then you have two different uh, states here. But if you can take this measurement and apply a Z conditional on the result of this X measurement, then these two different states, they're back on track and become the same one. Okay? One was already correct, but if the other had an error, you can correct the error and bring it back to being the correct state. The correct state in this case is being the same state at the beginning and the end. So this is a teleportation circuit. It's called one-bit one teleportation. And it's the, the, the initial building block for us to do computation this way. Okay? Next thing we do, we change the control knot into a control Z, control Z. I say Z and Z interchangeably. I lived in Canada and I lived in, 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 in England, and I screwed up all my English, is all mixed, so don't worry. <laughs> okay, so this is a, a control knot, this is a control Z with two Hadamas on the side. This is an identity again, okay? So, nothing much. From here to there, I, instead of starting with zero and applying Hadamard, I start with the plus, which is the same. It's the same state here. And here, what I did was to change the order of H and Z. Okay? If you change the order of H and Z, you obtain X and H instead. Okay? So this is an identity again. So why did I do these moves? Okay? I'm getting closer to the one-way model. Because now I'm starting with the ancillary states in the plus state, and I'm using CZ gates instead of C0 gates. Okay? So I'm just moving this identity, which just teleports the state, to be closer to what we want. OK, any question? So, so far, we just did some cosmetic changes to make it look like uh, one-way quantum computation. Now, the idea is, how do I teleport the state from here to there? Not just the state, but I want to teleport this unitary that I want to apply. So I want to teleport the state with a unitary applied to it. Okay? So that's the beginning of some computation via teleportation. So either you can do the unitary here and do the same teleportation uh, circuit that I did before. Of course, the state will come out exactly as the state that came in, which is U applied to Psi. Or I can do the changes that I'll do now, which is, first thing, U, this unitary I'm considering is a rotation around the Z axis. Okay? in the negative direction by angle theta. If you remember, if you go back, you find that you needed a minus here and not the two if you wanted theta over two. So this is a rotation around Z. It commutes with control Z. They're, di they're, they're diagonal in the same basis, the Z basis, okay? So you can change the order. Now, here what you have is a unitary followed by a X measurement, okay? So if you want to do a rotation and then measuring basis X, so this is the basis X in the block sphere, okay? So if you do a rotation negative and measuring the X basis, it's the same thing as measuring this rotated basis. It's exactly the same thing, okay? If you actually, that's the way that usually, if you want to make measurement on a rotated basis, you rotate first and measure in the basis that you always use. In this case, I'm talking about the X basis, right? So, what I'm, so in my notation here, 
I'll, I'll change this rotate and do X measurement by doing a rotated basis measurement, which is measured along this axis here. Okay, it's the same thing. So now, at the end here, you see there were, yes. True, I agree, I agree, yes, yes, yes. So it's all almost the same thing. He's saying, if you measure on, on the rotated basis, the final state is the rotated state. If you measure on X basis, the final state is the state. But for my purposes, all I'm interested in is what happens to the other qubits, which were entangled with this guy before, okay? Because after the measurement, I throw them away. That's why it's called one-way quantum computation. So I'm only interested in the effect on the other qubits. So I will never use this state again. So you're right. If I were to use the state, the state would not be the same. So this teleportation, so this is uh, the gate teleportation trick, which is the basis of uh, the Shuang and Gottesman idea. Originally, the idea was using the usual teleportation. If you remember, there's an original qubit, two EPR pairs. You do a joint measurement of these two, and this guy becomes the other one if you do the corrections, right? So it involves three qubits, two EPR and one. This gate is simplified. It just has two qubits. So instead of having an EPR, you directly entangle the original with one other qubit, okay? Which is this trick here. But conceptually, it's the same idea. I'm using teleportation to teleport a gate, teleport a state which is not exactly the same, but it's actually rotated, and that's what I want in this, in this protocol. Now, what I want to do is, what if I want to do many different steps, many different gates in a sequence? on the same qubit, this teleported way, okay? So you just concatenate two different circuits like this, okay? If you have a look at the circuits, it's exactly like this little bit here. It's exactly like what we had in the previous slide, except here we, we need this H here, right? So in the other one, we don't have an H here. So the result will not be just U applied to Psi, but H applied to U applied to Psi, fine? Because I, I decided not to include the H there. And then this state, I do the same step again, you see? If somebody has a pointer, maybe it could be helpful. Mine is kind of dying. Uh, if you had this, uh, the second stage here, because you want to do another unitary, and this is a, a, rot uh, a unitary which has uh, this angle theta 2 instead of theta. So you have theta 1 rotation, theta 2 rotation. So at the end here, you have h times u, and then h times the other u applied to psi by the same reasoning okay, that we had before. You just teleported twice. Right? So this is actually one way of doing universal uh, quantum computation via teleportation. You have to entangle, teleport, entangle, teleport, entangle, teleport, and in each teleportation step, you do some unitary. So you can do that this way. But I would like to do manipulations here to, say, to show that... Uh, can you hear me? No. Yes, okay to show that you can do the entanglement process all at the beginning. That's the one-way model, right? So how do you do that? So the goal here is to bring the CZ to the beginning because the entangled state, I want to create all the entanglement at the beginning, okay? So first thing, I can, I can move the CZ, change the order of this guy and get this guy, and the reason why I can, I can do that is because CZ is Clifford. Remember the property of the Clifford group? If you apply CZ and then a Pauling, it has to be the same as a Pauling, applying a different Pauling via CZ. So this commutation relation that's true for any, uh, any Clifford gate is the key thing here. If I want to bring the CZ to the beginning of the circuit, okay? You just have to find out, Brigade. You did too? Okay. Yes, it does, great. Okay, so because this guy is a Pauli, I know I can do the change, if I, but I have to compute which other Pauli will show up, okay, which will compensate the change. Do you understand? This is exactly because of the Clifford property of CZ, right? This is always possible. And the only thing that will happen is new Paulis may show up. In this case, a Z gate appeared here, and since this guy was, uh, was controlled, this guy has to be controlled too by the same regimen. Okay? So this works. And now, what I have here, 
depending on the first measurement, I know I, w I have to apply this correction on the second qubit, okay? And because of the second teleportation step, I'll have to measure the second qubit too. So either you do the correction, which is conditional, and then do the measurement, or you can, co you can look at this box, this whole box, as a measurement on a rotated basis, right? Because if you rotate by pi and then measure in this angle, this is equivalent to measuring to measuring in a in a rotated uh, sorry measuring if you didn't have the correction you measure an angle theta if you did have the correction that means applying an x gate so if this is the x and you would like to measure in this basis rotating by pi around the x is bringing this angle here theta to minus theta see you rotate around the axis so that's why the adaptive uh, depending on this outcome here you have to measure either in the plus theta basis or in the minus theta basis. There's two different bases in the equator of the block sphere. Okay, so that's the adaptativity. Adaptativity means I need to do this x before. That's all. Right? Doing the x means measuring in a different basis. Okay? So this so this is the circuit that does two concatenated unitaries. You start with ancilla states and plus states, you entangle them, you do a measurement, and sometimes you need to do measurements which depend on previous outcomes. See, in this case, you have to do a measurement here. And you have to keep track of the corrections you need to do. This correction changed this basis, but it's conditional. So you only know whether you have to measure in the changed basis when you know the result of this measurement. Okay? And this measurement will affect the other basis of this guy. If I do a new, st a new step, Third step, I would have these two corrections to take into account, right? And then I can conc concatenate the single qubit gates this way. Okay? Now, one observation. H times U, where U is this rotation by Z gazes, is universal. We've seen this for the case of T, the T gate, which is diagonal, right? We built this universality proof using H and T. So H and U alone, if you can vary the theta, is universal for a qubit, okay? So this means by concatenating, doing what I did here many times, you can apply many of these gates, H, U, H, U, H, U, and you can do any single qubit unitary the one way, way. <laughs> right? Okay? Do you have questions about this? Okay? But the world is not made of just single qubit unitaries, right? You need to do two qubit unitaries. So, so which, sim which other unitary is natural? A two qubit unitary is natural in this model. CZ, right? Because you're doing all the CZs here. So if, if imagine that you have a track, a track of teleportation steps, taking this qubit and doing unitaries on it to do a single unitary. And you do the same thing with a different track, another series of teleportations. At some point, you want to do a CZ between the two of them, right? The CZ will come as a CZ, for example, here, Opa, not here. 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 Connecting it to the other track, right? That's the applying the single qubit on the other guy, right? But DCZ is Clifford. You can always bring it to the left of the circuit by commuting it with Paulis only, because all the gates that I have there are Paulis. I only have Pauli corrections and CZs, Paulis, and measurements. The structure of, of these circuits is always the same. So this CZ can always be brought back by changing the correction. Some Paulis become other Paulis. There was an X here, there's another X, it cancels. There's a Z, cancels, see? And then this CZ can be brought back to the beginning. So you can do universal computation like this if you're careful and you do these propagation relations to move all the entanglement to the beginning of the circuit and to do the appropriate corrections. Okay? So, just looking a little bit more carefully at the correction process. <coughs> when you do the, when, you, do, when you, you want to do a measurement, but we've seen that previous measurements can bring corrections before the measurement. We've already seen what X does, okay? X turns the angle that you wanted to measure, you have to measure actually, actually minus theta. We've seen that already. But we haven't seen what Z does, right? But Z 
doing a Z measurement and then doing uh, sorry, doing a Z measurement and then uh, applying this measurement. Sorry, doing a Z operation unitary and then applying this rotated measurement. What you have to do is to measure in the same basis. Because what I'm asking is, I want to measure in this basis, but first I apply the Z measurement, a Z rotation. A Z rotation takes this state into this one and this one into this one. So what a Z correction does is, look, if you have to apply a Z before, just reinterpret the outcome that you had, because the measurement is going to be the same. Okay? This is the effect of Z measurements. So you don't ha actually have to do a correction. You just keep track in your mind, in your computer, that you have to interpret what's zero and one results opposite, right? So it's easier than the X correction. So the X correction, as I said, makes you adapt from this basis to this other one, and the X correction on the Z correct, the X correction, and the X and the Z correction just uh, you just reinterpret what the outcome is, right? Um, here I'm talking about outcomes plus and minus one, but many times you use zero and one. And then you have to rewrite it in a different, different way, but it's the same idea. Ah, so if you're doing this computation, this large computation, there are all these corrections to take into account. So you might be concerned about the following thing. Am I doing quantum computation? And actually, the classical computer that's keeping track of all these things is doing the computation for me. You see, you have to worry about the difficulty of doing this protocol in the classical computation. Otherwise, you're transferring the power to the classical computer. Not the, the, the correlations are not doing the computation for you, right? But if you pay the attention to this protocol, you find that all you have to do is to know how many axes there were here, and actually how many modulo two, because you just need to do to know if there were an even number which cancelled out, or an odd number of axes which result in an x, because x squared is equal to identity. You see. Same thing for Z. So the classical computer has just to keep track of all the measurements you're doing, and for each qubit, have a register saying how many X is modulo 2 I had, how many Z modulo 2 I had from the previous results. So it's a very restricted classical computer. It's not a universal class. You don't need a cla universal classical computer. You need a parity computer that just computes parity is modulo 2. So it's a very restricted classical computer. You're fine. Okay? The computation is very easy to do. You're not transferring power to the classical computation, this model. The last thing we, we want to do to change is the following. If you look at this, at this process, it doesn't look completely like one-way computation because this guy started in the psi state. The others, OK, started in plus states and were entangled, see? But this guy was in psi. But of course, the psi is the input to the problem. You can also start everybody with plus and do some, a single qubit unitary to take the plus into the input state you want, 0 and 1. Okay? It's very simple. So actually, the model doesn't, really, doesn't need for you to start in a quantum state. Right? Actually, you're solving problems which have a classical input. So you start with zeros and ones. But this means taking the plus and applying a gate or not. Okay? So with this, we come to the resource state sorry, to the one-way model. Everybody starts in plus. You have to, to start with some entanglement structure, and I'll discuss a little bit about it now. And you will do adaptive measurements in a sequence that will do the gates that you want. Single qubit gates, CZ gates are enough, right? And those single qubit gates I showed you are enough. So we have all the ingredients for one-way computation, right? We had a look a little bit at the other model, which is uh, the one that you entangle and teleport, entangle, teleport. But you, you have seen that they are equivalent, right? Uh, you, you have the choice of entangling, entangling, and teleporting, or entangling everybody the same thing. The choice is do that commutation I did in the circuits or not? OK? It's your choice. You have a question. Why did I do rotations only in the XY plane? That's because I'm teleporting, I'm teleporting the rotations around Z. So the, we, we found that if you just want to, to, to do Z gates, rotations around Z, you only need this adaptation. You might want to do other rotations because sometimes you can simplify the entanglement resource, for example, if you're able to do other rotations. 
but it's not necessary, okay? So it's enough to do these measurements only in the equator of the block sphere. But there are schemes which use in the equator of the block sphere and also the ZX uh, plane. And uh, sometimes you get some simplifications of the protocol. But you can do universal computation with this. If you just want a model that works, uh, measurements on the equator of the block sphere are sufficient. But for example, it's known that if you have a triangular lattice, bidimensional lattice, we know it's universal using these other rotations. But not just x, y. Yeah. OK? So, so I say, so you look at this picture and say, but where's Shor's algorithm in there? OK? Where's Grover's algorithm in there? Are you sure you're going to do computation with this? And how do you choose the algorithm? OK? You choose the algorithm by that procedure, right? The, the different concatenations in the, w the places where you put the CZ gates will change the structure, the entanglement structure. And will change also which angles you have to measure. Okay? So from the beginning, you say, if I want to do Grover, this guy has to be measured in plus minus theta, and you know the value of the theta, but you don't know if it's plus or minus, because you still have to wait for the other results right? for the procedure. So the algorithms will, will, be, will be different depending uh, what, what will be different from one algorithm to the other the sequence of qubits measured simultaneously, and the angles that they'll be measured. But the resource is, well, sorry. The resource has to, ha, may have some different entanglement, right? But it's true that there are resources which are universal for any computation you might do, right? We've seen this before in, in Philip's talk. And this is one of the resources. This is a square grid of entanglement. So, so, so each, each qubit is entangled with the CZ in the beginning, just with four neighbors, or just with three, as I told you, OK? So I'd like to talk a little bit about these resources for, for universal uh, computation and MBQC. So they are a very the common, a common class of resources are called graph states. Okay? And cluster states are an example of graph states. So what is a graph state? It's exactly what I, I was telling you all the time right? that we're going to do. You start with some sets of qubits in the plus state, and then you entangle them. But which guys are entangled with which ones? A graph will tell you which guys are entangled to which ones. So for example, these are many graphs, uh, and, you, and, and, and the, the edges will tell you who is entangled with whom at the beginning. This is at gates. So the state that you obtain by starting with this and entangling according to some graph is a graph state. Okay? So for example, this graph number seven is a chain. You see, you have five qubits. This is sufficient for any single qubit gate, because you can do, you can do one, two, three, four teleportation steps and implement four of those gates, which is equivalent to doing an arbitrary unitary state, unitary, a single qubit unitary. So a chain of five is sufficient for arbitrary. If you want to do a C naught gate, then you can use this graph here, okay, which has four qubits. This is enough for doing a C naught gate. And so on. But of course, well, another way to, to another way to characterize sorry to characterize these states is a graph state is what you obtain by doing this, but there's a different way to characterize it. If you take the graph that represents the graph state, the graph state is a unique state, which is a, a, a plus one eigenvalue eigenstate of a set of operators. Which operators? You take x on a qubit and z on its neighbors. And you do that for all qubits in the graph. This will give you n different uh, Pauli operators, okay? And the graph state is the unique state, which is an eigenstate with plus one eigenvalue of all these operators. You see? I, I gave you a prescription for finding a set of operators from a graph, and I guarantee that the graph that's built in this process is a plus one eigenstate of all these operators. It's the only guy that's the plus one eigenstate of all these operators. This is a theorem. I'm not proving it, okay? But it's a, an alternative characterization. And this is used, of course, in all calculations involving the one-way model the fact that these graphs have this property. And all the corrections are calculated involving that, because you know which states are stabilized. You stabilize the graph, the graph state, OK? So you may be concerned about this general the zoo of graphs. If I want to do a CZ, I have to use this graph, and I want to do this other guy. What if I want to do this particular circuit? Each circuit is going to be different. No, we have these universal families of, 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 of states, which uh, which are sufficient for any implementation. Okay? So this is one, this is the square grid. 
This is one implementation of, this, of, of the three qubit quantum Fourier transform used in Schor's algorithm using this. Okay? So if you look, what happened between here and here? Okay? You deleted uh, vertices that you don't need. Okay? How can you delete vertices that you don't need? You have to do a Z measurement. But doing a Z measurement, you just trace this guy out of the computation. But depending on the outcome, you, ha you, you, you change the graph state. The, the remaining three qubits. So you have to keep track. The deletion process is not like delete and forget about it. You have to delete everybody, but keep track of the results of the measurements that you use to delete them, because these will enter the corrections of the future computation. Okay? So this is a subtle point, but it's necessary. So you start with universal graph, you delete what you don't need, and then you adapt the measurements. Some of these are adaptive, some of them are fixed, and you are able, you can show, and uh, House and Duffin Briegel showed that you can do any computation using this graph state, a cluster state, a two dimensional uh, square grid. Okay? Since then, many other resources were found. Okay, hexagonal lattice, triangular, Kagome lattice. And these are all universal for quantum computation. Many times you obtain universality by reducing these graphs to some known resource, universal resource for measurement based quantum computation. There are some more recent results uh, showing that even more other families of graphs are universal, but using a slightly adapted version, uh, a different version of measurement based on computation, which requires a classical computer with full power to control. Because you see, I told you, I showed you, that uh, a classical computer with just the parity calculations is enough, right? But if you can, have, can use a classical computer which has full classical computation power, then you can use different resources which are more complicated because it's mugging some of the difficulty to the classical computer to keep track of the, the corrections and so on. Okay? So this is the idea of looking at these other constructions for, for universality, universal graphs for measuring basic kind of computation. And it's been shown by Wei, Affleck, Rausendorf that a, a two-dimensional model uh, has a ground state which is useful for universal quantum computation in MBQC. So that's interesting because it's the idea. Maybe you can build a system, re, uh, cool it to the round state, and use that ground state. Okay? This was mentioned by Philip. It's the same thing, same result. On the other hand, we know that some graphs are not enough. Okay? So you can do the simulation of what's going on in any chain, one-dimensional graph. Okay? A line of many qubits connected. This is simulable. Right? We've seen that you can do a single qubit with that. But actually, you can't do anything that's not simulable with this resource. So you can have an entanglement resource which is not universal. You can have universal, and you can have some which you don't know, right? And you have to find out. So it's an open research area. Uh, and, and many of the, the tools being used here are tools in many body physics, OK? People are building these ground states uh, with a view to use them for, for universal quantum computation. So I just would like to draw attention to one thing, which is, yes, sorry, question? Yes, good question. So I'm talking about graphs, but actually I shouldn't talk about one graph. I should talk about a family of graphs. So uh, when I say the cluster state is universal, I mean if it's big enough, you can do the quantum Fourier transform, for example or any, any number of qubits, but you have to graph to be, to be as big as the computation you want to do. So it's a, a family of graphs which can do any computation on n qubits, right? So for each size, you need a different size of the universal graph to do. And how many qubits do you need? We saw that a single qubit can be done with five, and a two, two qubit gate can be done with, well, C0 can be done with four. So there's a little blow up, but it's a constant size. But the number of, of vertices in the graph is roughly, well, it's a constant times the number of gates in the, in the unit area. You see, we're used to having a little memory, for example, 100 qubits and doing 10,000 gates. In the measurement-based model, this is going to be 10,000 qubits or more, like well, 50,000 qubits or something, okay, to do the same thing. So you, have, you need as many qubits as gates, a constant time the number of gates, right? But the fact that uh, the, the structure of entanglement is known is good. Because you can try to do all this entanglement at once. I'll, I'll mention a little bit about implementations. Uh, 
Uh, this can be generalized to Qubit, but I haven't seen much work. I know that uh, the condensed matter connection, many times the system that they analyze are spin one systems, for example, and then they are not qubits. Yeah, yeah. So it can be done, but most of the literature is done with qubits because you don't earn much. It's like quantum computation. You, you can do circuit model with Qubit, so any number of levels, but it doesn't change asymptotically the, re the, the, the requirements. So, what I wanted to draw attention is when you, we can, well, this particular case, okay, we can see that some guys, these black guys, are adaptive, okay? We need to wait for the results of others. But many of them are not. For the thing to work, they can be measured in fixed basis, okay? Because when you translate, you find that those parts of the circuit, they don't need any adaptivity, okay? So I translate in circuit to measure based on the computation. Some gates in the circuit model result in, in a measurement-based computation patterns which don't require adaptivity, right? So this means you can do all of those measurements in the first round of measurements because you don't have to wait for any results because there's no correction on them, okay? So this is neat because you can show that the pa parts of the protocol which, which correspond to Clifford gates are non-adaptive. You can show that by decomposing uh, well, but just looking at these patterns for uh, generating set of Clifford group, for example, there are different ways to see that. So this means if you translate from the circuit model to the one-way quantum computation model, the circuit has lots of Clifford gates, but you need at least the T gate, right? One gate outside of the Clifford group to do universal quantum computation, okay? But all the Clifford gates, when you do move to measurement based quantum computation, can be done at the first round. But then you have to take into, into consideration the adaptivity to do the other gates, okay? So there's a kind of time compression. The depth of the process in measurement-based quantum computation can be much smaller than the depth in terms of number of time steps in the, one way, in the quantum circuit model, okay? So this is interesting because this is something that the model, something the model points, something that the model brought for us, okay? It, it, it said, look, the Clifford part of a, a circuit can be done all at once, right? In, this, in the quantum circuit model, it's not obvious that this can be done, okay? But actually, after you, find, after you, you learn from measurement based on computation, then it becomes obvious, okay? So that's what I wanted to, to show you. So if you have a Clifford circuit, that's the circuit model, you can always implement it in a universal using a universal graph in measurement based on computation. So this is a particular type of universal graph called a, a brick work state. I'm using your pictures. Thank you, Danny. This, this graphs. Um, and then when you do that, you can, wh what you can do is bring this back into the circuit model, translate it back to the circuit model. Okay? Because this process of starting with plus eigenstates, entangling them and measuring them, you can represent in a circuit. Okay, so if you represent what you're doing here in the measurement based quantum comp protocol in a circuit, what you're doing is entangling guys and measuring them. For a general quantum circuit, these measurements, you can't do this measurement before this guy because there's a dependency, okay? But if the circuit is Clifford, there's no dependency, okay? The circuit, the, all these measurements, they can be done at once, all together because there's no adaptivity required. So this circuit here implements the same, uh, the same uh, circuit that this, this circuit does, okay? So going to measure based quantum computation and coming back to the measurement, to, to the circuit model, actually told you that you can do all the Clifford part very quickly, okay? And that was not obvious at all before measurement based quantum computation was invented. Okay, it's a different way to do it. You're compressing time at the cost, as Glossy notes, of enlarging the memory because the memory has to be as large as the number of gates you had in the original circuit. It's a constant time the number of gates, okay? But it may be useful. I mean, you're compressing time. If you have plenty of memory, that could be a useful trade-off. So different models allow for different trade-offs like that. And it's very nice the way that these trade-offs appear between circuit models and measure-based computation. Even if you, have a, uh, if you start with a, a, a circuit which is not Clifford but has just a few 
or any number actually of non Clifford gates. Okay? This number will translate as exactly the same number of adaptivities required. You still do all the Clifford part at once, but you have to wait for the others to do them layer by layer. Okay? Any questions? Yeah, well, okay, so he's asking about wh what are the different restraints you can put on time and memory in different models, right? So here, I mean, I'm saying that uh, you're, you're using much more memory, but it's a polynomial amount of memory because the, number, the, the, the size of the memory is the size of the circuit, and that's polynomial in the number of input qubits. So if you're, if you're doing trade-offs which are polynomial, you're not changing, it's all included, it's all allowed. So all these models, they are equivalent. When you say the circuit model is equivalent to measurement based on computation, you're saying that they're equivalent up to some polynomial overhead. So this cost n squared gates or, or operations, these other n cubed, it's considered all equivalent, okay, for these purposes. But of course, they're not all equivalent. I mean, if you tell an experimentalist you have to do a thousand operations or a billion, you know, it's just a constant difference. But for them, it's a huge difference, right? So it's very important to look at these trade-offs because Polynomial differences make a difference in practice, right? So all of these, they're not unbounded. I mean, uh, you, you don't have to, they're not fixed size. So this works for any size, and it's a polynomial overhead that you have. Any other questions? Okay. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, uh, implementations of measurement based quantum computation. Of course, there are some proof of principles involving photons. We've seen many of them yesterday. I just added one more because I, I, I think it's neat. Uh, it's topological error correction using cluster states of eight photons. It's more or less the biggest size you can do, as Philip explained to us, because of all the post-selection involved and, uh, and the difficulty of having all these uh, photon source pairs working simultaneously, right? They are probabilistic, the ones that we use so far. Um, you may ask, okay, but what if I want to do a really large quantum computation using this model, okay? There are, idea, there, there are systems which are called optical lattices, which create a, create a bidimensional uh, array of uh, uh, voltage uh, holes that can trap atoms, cold atoms. So if the atoms are cold enough, many times you start with the bose eisen condensate, you let them fall in this counter-propagating laser beams, which make this, uh, these valleys of, of, of potential. And then the atoms are trapped. And you can do it very controlled way. This is a, a picture by, by, what's his name? Well, it's from this paper. Immanuel Bloch group, okay? So each, it, here's just to aid the eye, okay? Each little point of this is one atom trapped in this, in the, in this, uh, in this uh, optical lattice, okay? And they can actually move, change the atom state. This is, uh, this is, this is a visualization of the spin of, of those atoms. And you can move the spin of individual atoms to make these di little drawings, okay? And they actually even light up, they change the spin of this one to serve as a reference for phase for the others. They actually have lots of control about this. So in a system like this, the, the ch kind of challenge that people have is trapping them, of course, leaving one atom per site, which they can more or less do now, but you have to address them individually because you need to be able to do the equivalent, the single qubit measurements. And you need to be able beforehand to entangle them, right? So the, the hope is that you can do this entangling round all at once, okay? You can change the, 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 the spacing of the whole lattice so that everybody entangles with the next, okay? Like the wave functions will overlap and then they get entangled. So this whole construction of the graph would be done in a single step. But still, you would, would need to be able to address individually each one to rotate and measure, rotate and measure with a different laser. So they were doing something like this. They, they, they were able to indi address individually, which is necessary to build these patterns here, okay? But I don't think this guy, th these guys were not entangled as we required. But it's a technology that can be developed. Maybe we'll get there.
Um, another advantage of the one-way model, as, as Philip already stressed last time, is that the resource can be built offline. Offline means you build it before you start your computation. Okay? And the way to build, you can, you can take two different cluster states, for example, and try to connect these two via probabilistic gate. If it works, you have a larger graph state. If it fails, you, s you spoil a little bit of your graph, but you can try again with a different, a different part. You see? So you can do this growth process of graph states before you start the computation. So you're not spoiling quantum information that you're storing anywhere. You're just trying to build the state that you will need in the future for the quantum computation. Right? So many gates are, are, have been studied that do this probabilistically. Right? And if the probability is larger than a half, then you, on average, grow. And uh, that's the kind of thing people investigate using uh, photons to build large cluster states. So either you can do that this way, which is try to get it as big as possible or big enough for your computation, for the computation you want to do, assuming you can control all the parameters and address them individually and so on, right? which is a lot. Or you can do them more or less this way, which is you entangle them just not all the graph at once, but step by step, a la teleportation. Right? So for example, if you want to do a computation on, on I don't know, 30 qubits, Right? You need 30 qubits, and you can entangle them with 30 others and do gate teleportation. Right? You don't need to have the whole graph in the beginning. You, you pass on the information to the new graph, which is small, the size of the input, more or less, uh, changed with the unitary applied to it. And then you build it step by step. So this is nice because if, you're, if, if these graph states are coming from photons, the photons are flying at the speed of light, right? So you don't have time to store everything, make it very large, and then measure. So you have to entangle, measure, entangle, measure, entangle, measure, because they're being entangled here, and they're measured in this other bench here on the lab. So you have this time you know, to make it happen. So you don't build all the, all the cluster state at once, but you do it slowly. So if you do all the cluster state at once, it's nice because you know you want to do, you can do the whole computation. Right? But doing it step by step is also adv advantageous because you can, you can do it in the setting in which uh, you, you do it. I mean, it may be more practical. And also because the entanglement is not there on the lab waiting and decohering. Right? You don't have interference on your cluster state if you're building it step by step. The, de the, the interference is smaller. Right? So that's an, uh, one advantage. There are advantages to both, both ways of doing it. So there are many different schemes people propose if they're building things and things don't work. So you may get something, oh, I wanted to do a cluster state, but many times my probabilistic gates didn't work, so I have this full of holes, right? So this is a random graph because many of the connections worked and many of them didn't. So you don't have a cluster state. You have a messy state, okay? It's a, it's a random thing. But we can use ideas from percolation theory to post-process this guy by measuring some vertices and changing the state accordingly and keeping track of what you're doing to the state in this process. And then you can build some graph which is universal from this one, like the octagonal lattice that happens here. It doesn't look like octagonal lattice, right? But it is. Uh, so there are ideas for doing that. It's a way ways to correct uh, these imperfect resource states that you have. Um, now, now I'm joining some things that I did, okay? So, not I did, people did. Uh, IQP circuits, we've seen them at the beginning of the class, and we've seen B MBQC. So, how do you implement IQP circuits in MBQC, okay? So, this is an IQP circuit. They're all commuting the X basis, okay? So, you can change the order, it's the same thing, the probabilities don't change. When you translate that to uh, measurement based quantum computation, Okay, there's a way to do this translation which, in which all the measurements, I mean, each measurement in a is in a basis which is related to the gate that you're applying. Of course, this gate involves some angle, okay? So this angle translates as an angle of measurement. And these measurements are, X, are auxiliary X measurements. But the important thing is, this, this graph here, it doesn't involve adaptivity, okay? When you do, the tr I'm not proving it, I'm just telling you. When you translate these IQP circuits into a measurement based on computation, there's no adaptivity required. Okay? So this means, which is, 
that's a nice equivalence between the two models. Here, the order doesn't matter, okay? There's no temporal order. You can do them in any order, it's the same thing. And here, in measurement based on computation, you can do them all at once, okay? You can do all the measurements at once. So this is a translation between two different characteristics of these restricted models. And the interesting thing that was done, oops, sorry. Oh, it was done, but I think I skipped it. <laughs> Too bad. I can tell you, okay? I can tell you. Then what, what, what people did, uh, a paper by Rausendorf and Brown, uh, they showed that, uh, not Brown, sorry, Rausendorf and other people, they showed that uh, a particular class of these circuits, okay, I mean, these circuits are, are hard if you believe that polynomial hierarchy argument, I told you, post-selection argument, right? So they chose a particular subclass of the circuits, and they showed that uh, the, the, the measurement based on computation has to be hard too. Of course, one, one translates into the other, okay? But for this particular class that they, they studied, they called IQP star, uh, the interesting thing is you, you can, these final measurements that you do, okay, each guy has to be measured in a different basis, but it's not adaptive. So what can you do? You can, you can f before doing the measurement, you decohere the state in its eigenbasis, in the eigenbasis of the measurement you're about to do, okay? So for example, if you, if you want to make a Z measurement on this qubit, right, you can couple it to another one, make a, 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 a decohering channel that decoheres it in the Z basis. So this doesn't change the outcome probabilities. So if you do that with the different angles that are going to be measured, this process of decoherence doesn't affect the outcomes. Nevertheless, we know that this should be hard to simulate. But when you look at the state that you get from this protocol, followed by the coherence in each of these eigenbases, the state that results doesn't have any entanglement and doesn't have any discord. And nevertheless, it must be hard to simulate because of our post-selection argument. Okay? So they call, this paper is called classical measurement based quantum computation because the resulting uh, state that they measure has no entanglement and no discord and nevertheless must be hard to simulate. So this points at the hardness of simulation of some classical distributions which are built this way. Okay? So it's kind of intriguing. Okay? So you might ask, so what, what, how can it be hard to, to, to measure if the, it's, everything's classical, right? So my answer would be, not everything's classical because the whole process was quantum. You had to start with these states, entangle them, right? And then do the measurements on these different angles following the quantum mechanical rules. Only before the measurement do you apply this decoherence mechanism, but the quantum part was done. So the quantum is actually in the history of the states, you see? So my conjecture is that you should be able to prove that something in the history, in the entangling process, in the measurement process, has to be quantum for this final distribution to be hard to simulate. But it's an intriguing new development. This was all done last year. I, I erased my, my slide, sorry. I'm about to finish, I'm close to finishing. So, we've seen that uh, measurement-based quantum computation has applications because of this neat separation between classical part of the computation and quantum part of the computation allows for uh, this client-server applications, blind quantum computation, for example, that Philip described to us yesterday. So this is very nice. Uh, I, maybe I shouldn't call it application, right? But I, I, I find I'm a theorist. I'm very interested in the foundation aspects of, of this kind of model, right? And uh, in a paper by Rausendorf and, and collaborators, they, they suggested that measurement based quantum computation could be used as a toy model for quantum space time. So this means what? What? <laughs> what? So what do they do? Like people believe that, or they make models in which uh, the space time structure of the universe, right, happens from. Uh, from quantum mechanics, that space-time itself is quantum mechanical. And there are some rules, right, or some principles that guide the space-time to behave as we know it to behave, to be three-dimensional, for example, right, with one, one time uh, dimension. Uh, 
So many people working in quantum gravity, they come up with these models, triangulation models, causal set models, and so on, to try to come up with this structure. So what they point out in this uh, paper is that many characteristics of measuring based quantum computation help in building little toy models which are discrete for, for uh, a quantum space-time. So this quantum space-time foam, sometimes it's called, right? The role of it is played by graph states in measuring based quantum computation. Events in the universe, okay, are the measurements that you can do in measuring based quantum computation, which are discrete sets, okay? So this makes it a toy model. It's, it's easy to deal with. And then people look for a principle that establishes a uh, some principle that, that will make uh, space-time be for example, three-dimensional, with one dimension of time, uh, so that it self-organizes in this structure, okay? This set of quantum events organizes itself in some structure. So what, what, what would play the role of this in the measurement based on computation? This would be the requirement for determinism for a computation, which means you can look at all the different graphs that you can use to do a computation. Not all of them allow for you to do universal quantum computation. So if there are some process that creates these graphs in nature, okay, entangle, entangled systems in nature, and if there's a principle saying, uh, I only want to create these guys with high probability if they enable deterministic quantum computation, this will very strongly constrain the form of the graphs that you can have. So I'm not looking about the, the grid, I'm, I'm talking about random graphs, right? But if you demand, I want a graph to be random, but I want it to be random so that corrections can be done for deterministic computation to be done in the one-way model somehow, okay? So they study how this constrains the graphs that you can have. So in, in, in the sense of the, what you're modeling, how would uh, the determinism requirement globally restrain the, the structure of space-time? So it's a, it's a source for a principle that would make uh, some random space-time actually have a structure that we see. So it's, and they managed to prove some analogs of some theorems which are known right, for, for some models of quantum space-time in measuring based quantum computation. So I obtained some results similar to these ones about before, but not similar, but a particular example, which is a, a, an analog of a closed time-like curve, which is a time travel, which is time travel, okay, in measuring based quantum computation. So basically, I don't have time to go through it, but um, you can look at the sequence of measurements which implement a quantum computation, and you can artificially manipulate this measurement, uh, the, the time organization of the sequence, to make, something like, to make something like this happen. You have to measure this guy based on a result of a measurement that's going to happen in the future only. Okay? So this is uh, information coming from the future to tell me that I ha what measurement I have to do now. So you obtain something like this, formally manipulating a perfectly nice time-respecting uh, sequence of measurement based quantum computation. And then we analyzed this, uh, what, what kind of time travel is this? And actually found there are two different models that describe quantum time travel, at least two. And, uh, and this time travel that we, we found in measurement based quantum computation corresponds to one of them and not to the other. Okay? So I don't have time to go through that, but I'll, I'll leave that, I'll leave the slides explaining this in my lecture notes so you can, you can have a look later. Um, and this is what I plan to do now. We're, we're finished, so thank you. Uh, more questions? <laughs> she ignored you. Ernesto, I have a very naive question about this uh, space-time structure. So how can, for example, we map the simple objects of space-time, like a point, a straight line, and so on, into graphs? How, how could this be done? I mean, there, there are other models for space-time which are discrete, and they, they manage to, they try to uh, reobtain this structure. So basically, for example, you, you can take a, random, a classical model, which is a random graph, okay? If you look at random graphs in mathematics, which are very large, and you link them randomly, you find that uh, with high, very high probability, they only have three layers. If you're thinking of the, it's, it has to be a directed graph, which is a graph in which each vertex comes before the other one. So when you connect two, you have to say, this guy is after this one. 
So this notion of after is the after in time you know, that we're modeling. Okay, so it's a directed graph that you need. So if you do directed graphs at random, you find that uh, the time structure is kind of layered. There are just three layers. Just because, I know, some mathematical properties which are not intuitive. So, if, if, so this means if the, the events of the universe, each event is a point, and they are, they are built with respect to the others randomly, uh, they wouldn't have a, a, a structure uh, which, which is three-dimensional. They would be flat. Like everything would happen at the beginning of the universe. There, would, there, wouldn't, there wouldn't be a three-dimensional universe and a time that progresses and so on. So it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to... I don't know much about that, but it, it's hard to, to visualize this thing. But you can ask whether, for example, the distance between points in terms of how many, how many graph edges you have to go between two points, that would be the, 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 the invariance distance in, in a relativity, you see? So if you build a random graph, you can see what's the average distance between points. When you, when you go to larger distances, how does the area increase? That's the kind of, you have to define this equivalence uh, between continuous things like uh, distance and area to graph theoretical things like uh, uh, average girth of the graph. Don't know, there are some numbers that people define for graphs. So you have to be, there is a mapping that you can do, but it's, it's all toy theory, right? So the same thing would apply to this in a more complicated setting because it's quantum. Well, I don't, I don't know if I helped you, but you should have a look at the paper. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So you, you showed us how to, to uh, simulate IQP circuits by starting with a universal graph and then whittling it away with decoherence. Is there a known family of uh, non-universal graphs that are sufficient for these restricted models, like IQP or DQC1? Uh, I see. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. The, the question was whether whether restricted models may be based in measure-based quantum computation might be implemented in a graph which is not universal for for universal quantum computation. Um, I don't know. That's an interesting question. Because the restriction would be in the entanglement graph, entanglement graph, and maybe the, the extra power would come just from pro-selection or something. I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> More questions? So there is an announcement. About the T-shirts, uh, the price will be 20 reais, and the people that show interest, I'm, I'm be waiting for the size because nobody gave the size of the T-shirt. So we'll be doing this today, and it will be ready tomorrow, so that people that are.